Good morning. Welcome to Medical Grand Rounds. When today is part of a series of the most satisfying rounds for all of us because it allows us to grasp the teaching chore that we have in training our house staff who are devoted to internal medicine and understand and be satisfied with how well we accomplish this chore as we will today when we hear from Dr. Yakira David who is our chief resident concerned with ambulatory care at Downstate, bridging the gap on racial disparities, what have we accomplished? A challenging title, twofold. Dr. David has begun her medical career by getting an MD from the University of the West Indies in Tobago. She completed her residency in internal medicine at SUNY Downstate. And uh, as our chief medical res resident, she dedicated herself to medical education concerned with health and research in the field of gastroenterology. And she's published several times on the impact of race on colorectal cancer staging and diagnosis. When she finishes with us in June, she will spend further training time at Mount Sinai Hospital by starting her fellowship in July in gastroenterology at the New York facility of Mount Sinai Hospital. Hospital. She's been recognized both as intern of the year at SUNY Downstate in internal medicine, as well as been awarded resident of the year at Kings County Hospital. She would like us to derive from hearing her today an awareness of the areas in which racial health disparities are most dominant and may modify our treatment or the outcome of the patients of other races. And she would like us to be aware of the resources currently available to reduce racial health disparities impact and to understand that there's a need for more research and we are ideally positioned at the downstate hospital complexes to do that kind of investigation and learn more about racial disparities and how they change what the med medical doctor can accomplish and does accomplish. Please join me in welcoming Dr. David today. Thank you, Dr. Friedman, for those warm, welcoming remarks. And thank you, everyone, for showing up to hear my talk. So as Dr. Friedman alluded to, today my talk will be on bridging the gap in racial healthcare disparities. What have we accomplished? So I have no financial disclosures. At the end of this talk, I'm hoping that we have a better understanding of what exactly health and healthcare disparities are what's our current state of racial healthcare disparities, what are the contributing factors to these disparities, an overview of the initiatives and what has been accomplished by them, and what is Downstate's role in addressing healthcare disparities. Now, disparities in healthcare between different races first gained significant national attention from the US Department of Health in 1985 with the publishing of the Heckler Report which really sought to identify areas in which there were gaps between different races and set out a series of initiatives and, and objectives to improve that. Now, since that time, a number of agencies have all done similar things, where they've looked at information regarding healthcare disparities. And this has ranged from federal institutions to citywide institutions, to associations of different physicians which have all sought to identify these areas. And right here at Downstate, the Brooklyn Health Disparity Center, which is a collaboration between SUNY Downstate, the Arthur Ashe Institute of Urban Health, and the Brooklyn Borough Presidents, 
they have done quite a lot of work within our own communities regarding healthcare disparities. Now, Healthy People 2020 was developed by a federal interagency task force that gathered information from around the nation, identified areas of priorities for health as the entire nation, as well as put for forward a 10-year plan of objectives that should be achieved. And one of their high priorities is really healthcare disparities amongst different races. Now these, these agencies all have different backgrounds, but they have one common agenda. And that agenda is to achieve health equity, eliminate disparities, and improve the health of all groups. So let's start off with some definitions. So a health disparity is a difference in the burden of illness, injury, disability, or mortality experienced by one population group relative to another. Now a health care disparity is a difference between groups in terms of health insurance coverage, access to, use of, and quality of care. And our goal, which is health equity, is the attainment of the highest level of health for all people through valuing everyone equally with societal efforts to address avoidable inequalities, historical and contemporary injustices, and the elimination of health and healthcare disparities. And this is not merely giving everybody the same equal resource, but rather identifying that different people have different needs and adjusting the resources that are allocated to them so that the outcome is what is the same. Now there are different population characteristics in which disparities can exist. And this ranges from differences in language, geography, disability status, gender, sexual orientation, education, immigration, and socioeconomic status. But today's talk focuses on differences based on race or ethnicity. Now, if we're talking about race, let's see what our population looks like. So the most recent US census estimates that about 73% of the population identifies as being white, with the rest classified collectively as minorities. And of those, 12.6% are African American, 5.2% are Asian, and 3.1% are of mixed race. And if we look at ethnicity, currently 16.7% of the population identifies as being of Hispanic background. So one of the most basic ways in which we can assess a population's health is to look at their life expectancy. So let me ask you a question. What is the estimated difference in life expectancy between whites and African Americans? No music today? No music? Okay. <laughs> All right. So let's take a look. So if we look at an estimate of trends from 1999 to 2013, these are white patients up here on this blue line with black patients down here on the black line. And in 1999, it was estimated that the difference in years was actually about six years. And that has narrowed somewhat, and more recent estimates in 2013 estimate that gap to be about 3.6 years. Now you might say 3.6 years, that doesn't sound so terrible. That's like Obama living to 87 and Trump living to 90, which may or may not be bad depending on how you look at it. <laughs> but let's take it in a different perspective. Let's go on a subway, a subway ride. Let's go on the three and the four line and do some traveling. So over here in Brownsville, 76% of the population is African American and their life expectancy is 74.1 years. If we go next door in Crown Heights, the population is 64% African American with a life expectancy of 77 years. And if we hop across to Park Slope, where 10% of the population is African American and the life expectancy goes up to 80.3 years. And once we cross the East River to the financial district on Upper East Side, where less than 5% of the population is African American, the life expectancy goes up to 85 years. So if we compare Brownsville over here to the Upper East Side and the financial district, that's actually 11 years different in life expectancy in just like a 30 minute commute. Paradoxically, however, if you look at East Flatbush, 89% of the population is African American, and the life expectancy there is 82 years. I can't help but sort of assume but extrapolate that maybe downstate in Kings County has something to do with that. 
<laughs> so one of the re relief readers that contribute the most to this mortality disparity. Now even though it's narrowing, the diseases that still account for most of the disparities that are observed are heart disease, cancer, and HIV disease. And if we look at trends in death from cardiovascular disease by race, over a 10-year period, it has narrowed from about a gap of 100 to 100,000 in 2004 to a gap of about 70 in 2014. Let's think of this in a clinical context. So a 59-year-old uninsured African-American woman with a rejection fraction of 25% presents to the emergency department for the fourth time this month with a CHF exacerbation. She has not had any workup to determine the etiology of her CHF. She has no usual PCP, but she reports adherence with the following meds. So she's on Lasix, Metoprolol, Lisinopril, and Trinolactone. Which of the following are health disparity factors that contribute to her morbidity and her expected higher mortality? Now, there isn't necessarily a right answer here, but I'm just trying to assess where your headspace might be. So have fun. I'm missing the music. <laughs> not bad at all, not bad at all. So if we start off by looking at risk factors that contribute to these disparities in, in cardiovascular disease, I'm looking at two graphs from Healthy People 2020, and they always put out a set of goals, a target for the population, which is always identified along this red dashed line for all of the graphs. So over here for hypertension, the goal is to have about 27% of your population, and no more than that, having hypertension. But African Americans here in orange consistently have higher rates of hypertension, even over a 10-year period, whereas white patients here in blue are pretty much at target. Now this graph over here is very busy, but I want to draw your attention to this blue line here, which, rec which would represent African Americans, compared to this yellowish line here, which rep represents white patients. And these are cases of new, epi new cases of diabetes mellitus. And you can see that African Americans have significantly higher rates of developing diabetes compared with white patients. So let's put risk factors aside and look at the care that patients receive. So this is a study done by Tenetal in 2001 in which they looked at the rate of use of cardiac cath after an acute myocardial infarction. And they were looking to see if there was any difference between having a white physician or a black physician. And what they found was that regardless of what the background of your physician was, black patients, for whatever reason, were less likely to have received a cardiac cath than white patients. Whether this was a measure of whether it was recommended or whether the patients complied, they weren't able to actually identify what the root cause of it was. Now let's talk a little bit about cancer. We have another case. So a 56-year-old African-American gentleman presents to your primary care practice to establish care. As part of his preventative care, he asked about screening for prostate cancer. What's the discussion that we have with him? So that we tell him that current guidelines recommend against screening for prostate cancer, or that most men with prostate cancer die of something else, and the risks associated with screening outweigh the potential benefits? Or do we tell him that, yes, prostate cancer has, has risk, but he may be at a higher risk of prostate cancer incidence and mortality, or do we just go ahead and order the PSA? Again, not necessarily a right answer, but let me just see where you're thinking. If we look at incidence of cancer, all cancers as a whole, between races, we can see that black men have a higher incidence of cancer than all of the other races, whereas white women, black women, sorry, have a slightly lower incidence than other races for all cancers. But when we look at mortality, however, both black men and black women have higher rates of mortality than any of the other races. So the top four fatal cancers are lung, breast, colorectal, and prostate cancer. Let's see how the races stack up for those four. 
So this is lung cancer, and again, this is the target set by healthy people, this red dashed line. And African Americans are here on this blue line, and white patients are on the red line. And you can see they're pretty much together and at, and at goal for what Healthy People 2020 has outlined. But let's take a look at breast cancer. Again, black patients are all the way up here compared to white patients down here who are pretty much at the goal for Healthy People 2020. For prostate cancer, a similar picture is seen here with black patients up here on this blue line and white patients down here below the target for Healthy People 2020. And for colorectal cancer mortality, Again, the same pattern pervades. So for three out of the four top fatal cancers, African Americans have higher rates of mortality. Now let's talk a little bit about HIV. No question here, but just think about it again. So Ms. Ellen is a 45-year-old African American woman admitted to the MICU with cryptococcal meningitis. Chart review shows that she had a positive HIV test two years prior but since then has had no documentation of attending the HIV clinic. On regaining her mental status, you ask her, why, why didn't you ever go for care? And she says, antiretrovirals are another one of those government guinea pig experiments. Now, are her concerns unfounded? Do they have any foundation? Now, when patients do not feel or trust antiretrovirals, they won't take them. As a result, they have lower rates of viral suppression, higher rates of transmission, and of course, higher mortality. And that's exactly what we see over here. Black patients have over almost four times the rates of, transmission of new cases of HIV compared with the rest of the population. And in terms of mortality, these two lines are both African-American men of different ages, whereas these two lines are white men of different ages. And I don't need to explain this graph. It's clearly different. So what? You might say, well, this is just a minority of the population. So as a population as a whole, we're probably not doing too badly off, right? But if we look at where the population is projected to go over the next 40 years or so, so the blue line represents the estimation in 2060, whereas the green line represents where we are currently. And you can see that minorities in 2060 as a whole are projected to creep into the majority. So that's a larger proportion of your population that will be experiencing lower, poorer healthcare outcomes. And what about the cost? Everybody likes dollars and cents. How much does it cost? What do you think? So it's, oops, so it's estimated that $35 billion per year is spent in excess healthcare expenditures due to racial healthcare disparities. And that does not take into consideration the excess $10 billion that's lost in productivity or the $200 billion that are lost in premature deaths. So what are the contributing factors for racial healthcare disparities? The so there, uh, there are a number of factors, it's very multifactorial. So it's a combination of social factors, genetics, and behavior. And the talk today really focuses on the impact of health services on racial healthcare disparities. So what, can, what impact can be made by targeting health services? The Kelly Report was a report done by the, Black Congress the Congressional Black Caucus Movement in which they identified a few key areas that have to be addressed within healthcare in order to reduce disparities. And they focused on federal action, access, workforce diversity, innovation and research, and community engagement. So federal action has the potential to impact all of those other areas. It can directly impact access to coverage, access to healthcare, your workforce, research funding, as well as funding for community programs. Let's take a walk through history and see how federal action has impacted racial healthcare disparities. In 1877, this was not too long after the abolition of slavery, the Jim Crow laws came into effect. And these were a series of laws in the south of, of the US which mandated segregation at all public facilities. So as a result of that, 
there were many, many facilities in which African Americans could not access care in any form. So of course there was opposition to this. And in 1896, there was a big trial, but there was a Supreme Court ruling in the Plessy versus Ferguson trial that upheld racial segregation laws for public facilities as long as they had equal quality. Who was monitoring the quality? Needless to say, there was no quality monitoring. So African Americans, were, if they had any facilities at all, were of always of poorer quality. Now in 1946, the Hill-Burton Act was passed. And this was an act that increased public funding to improve the number of hospitals and healthcare facilities that were available. And there was some outcry that federal funds should not be used for, for segregated facilities. So the Hilburton Act said, you know what, we don't want you to discriminate, but if you have separate but equal facilities, it's okay. Needless to say, no one again was monitoring the quality of these, these facilities. It wasn't until 1964 when the Civil Rights Act was passed that discrimination in institutions was outright outlawed. And if you received any federal assistance, you could not have discrimination in your facilities. A year later, this was compounded by the Medicare and Medicaid Act, in which facilities had to comply with the Civil Rights Act in order to receive reimbursement. And moving forward to 2010, the Affordable Care Act was passed, which improved rates of insurance for all persons. So that's just a way in which you can see how federal action can either hurt racial healthcare disparities, or it can really help and have a significant impact. Now, what about access to care? Access to care can be thought as in terms of having access to insurance coverage, as well as having access to a usual source of care or having a medical home. In terms of access to medical care, the impact that Medicare, Medicaid, and Affordable Care Act has had on insurance, on insurance rates is really significant. So for a population as a whole, on insurance rates went from 25 to about 15% after Medicare and Medicaid was instituted, and then it further dropped after the Affordable Care Act was passed from about 16% to about 9%. So it improved on insurance rates for everyone. And if we look at the impact of the Affordable Care Act on, on insurance rates between races, white patients are down here in purple and they benefited their rates of an uninsurance went from to about 16% to 9%. But the drop in, in uninsurance rates for African Americans went from just about 28% to almost half, almost 14.5%. So the Affordable Care Act has improved access in terms of insurance coverage for African Americans significantly. Now what about having a usual source of care or um, having a medical home? This was a study done by the Commonwealth Fund in 2006 in which they looked at the ability of patients to be able to access care when they needed it if they had a set medical home. Now patients in the navy blue columns, those are patients that have a set medical home. And whenever they needed care, they were almost equally able to access care when it was needed. However, amongst patients that don't have a medical home or a usual source of care, when they needed to have care, white patients were more likely than African American patients or Hispanic patients to be able to get care from anywhere else if they didn't have a set medical home. Now, what are the factors that contributed to this? So, as I was mentioning, there was clear racial segregation in healthcare facilities. Now, this is a picture from a hospital dispensary in Washington, D.C. in the 1950s. And over here, you can see there's a colored men's waiting room and a white men's waiting room. Now, this is probably one of those facilities that was considered to be a mixed race facility in which they provided care for both races, but in separate areas. So just as how they have separate waiting rooms, they probably had separate treatment wards. And often it was the case that wards that serviced African Americans were either in the basement or the attic or somewhere that was not as well developed as those that served white patients. The other facilities that were around were those that just outright did not admit African Americans. And then there were some facilities that were integrated. In 1956, a study was done on segregation and discrimination in medical care in the United States. And if we look at hospitals in the North, 82.5% of them were integrated at that point in time. But in the South, less than 6% of facilities were integrated at that point in time. So there were, 
there was, you know, there was really no place that African Americans in the South can really access care readily. So what drove the end of segregation in the healthcare system? So as I was mentioning, in, the, in 1964, the Civil Rights Act prohibited discrimination in institutions that received federal funding. But some of the federal institutions, as well as all of the private institutions, only 49% of them complied a year within a, after assessing them after a year. It wasn't until 1965 when Medicare and Medicaid came on board where no hospital could receive any reimbursement unless they complied with the Civil Rights Act that 100% of the facilities complied. So those are the efforts of, of federal action that sought to improve access to care for all persons. But what about physician-driven efforts? I wanted to highlight, highlight Dr. Robert Smith, who was a physician in Mississippi in the 1940s, 1950s. And he founded the Medical Committee for Human Rights, which then went on to become the medical arm of the civil rights movement. Now, their role at that time was to really drive a lot of the policy changes in the Civil Rights Act that improved access for all patients, as well as on a more hands-on level, they treated a lot of the injuries sustained by people who were involved in the Civil Rights Movement who were victims of violence from other members in society, as well as law enforcement agencies. He further went on to found the nation's first desegregated rural community health center in Mississippi in 1964, and then further went on to conceptualize and, and write the proposal for federally qualified health centers that we know today. This is him in 2017, just last year, receiving the AMA Medal of Valor, because his actions during the civil rights movement would have actually been of physical, could have potentially been of, of physical harm to him. Now, there were also physician-driven physician efforts as a group. Now, this is the National Medical Association that I actually hadn't really heard of before researching for this presentation. And this is an organization of African-American physicians that was formed because the American Medical Association did not permit membership to African-Americans before the late 1960s. So not only were they advocating for their own membership, this is them here picketing outside one of the American Medical Association's conventions for themselves, but they were also very instrumental in the Civil Rights Act and protesting and, and mobilizing to improve social justice for all, all persons. So where are we 50 years later? Have we gotten anywhere? So again, looking at healthy people's estimates, um, this, this chart is looking at persons who have a usual primary care provider. So again, this is what Healthy People 2020, that's their target. And in this fluorescent green line over here, you have white patients, and they're not quite at the target, but they're closer. Whereas down here in yellow, you have African Americans who are significantly less likely to have a usual primary care provider, and Hispanics are all the way at the bottom. So what's been done? So HRSA, the Health Resources and Service Administration, has developed a series of health centers across the nation. And these are the children of the federal, federally qualified health centers that Dr. Robert Smith founded. And NYC Health and Hospitals, as well as the Institute for Family Health, those are the New York organizations that fall under that umbrella. And they are making significant inroads in terms of servicing persons who otherwise would not get care. And between 2001 to 2016, the number of patients that are serviced by HRSA have increased from 10.3 million to 26 million. So they are making quite a significant impact in servicing people. And if you look at the makeup of people who are serviced by NYC HHC, approximately 92% of the population, all of these here, all of these constitute minority populations. So I must say that we are making a significant impact in providing care to, to minority patients that otherwise would not be able to. Now, one of the other areas that was identified in terms of reducing healthcare disparities is in workforce diversity and cultural competency. Why is this important? A survey that was done by the Commonwealth Fund in 2002 asked patients if they thought that they would have
Good morning. Welcome to Medical Grand Rounds. When today is part of a series of the most satisfying rounds for all of us because it allows us to grasp the teaching chore that we have in training our house staff who are devoted to internal medicine and understand and be satisfied with how well we accomplish this chore as we will today when we hear from Dr. Yakira David who is our chief resident concerned with ambulatory care at Downstate, bridging the gap on racial disparities, what have we accomplished? A challenging title, twofold. Dr. David has begun her medical career by getting an MD from the University of the West Indies in Tobago. She completed her residency in internal medicine at SUNY Downstate. And uh, as our chief medical res resident, she dedicated herself to medical education concerned with health and research in the field of gastroenterology. And she's published several times on the impact of race on colorectal cancer. The of care had they been of a different race. And you can see that all of the minorities, African Americans, Hispanics, and Asians, a lot more of them thought that the care that they would have received would have been different if they were of another race. What are some of the factors contributing to this perception? So again, we have to go back into history and examine mistrust of the healthcare system. Now this goes as far back as slavery days. So this is Dr. Sims, Dr. Sims of the speculum and the examination position. And it's documented that he did a number of experiments on slaves without their consent. In fact, his, his, his procedure for, for correcting vesicle vaginal fistulas was perfected on three slave women before he even started going on to treat white patients. More recently, the Tuskegee syphilis experiment, which is well documented, was not just an, an initiative by a random physician in a back alley somewhere, but this was a federally funded, CDC-driven study in which penicillin was deliberately withheld from African Americans in order to study the natural history of syphilis. And Henrietta Lacks in 1951, she was an African American lady who had cervical cancer and sought care at Johns Hopkins Hospital. And while there, she had some of her cervical cancer cells removed and used to generate the first immortal cell line culture. Now because of that, a number of health discoveries that have affected everybody have been discovered. But the problem here is that it was done completely without her consent and her family was never informed. In addition to mistrust of the healthcare system, problems with communication are also an issue. Again, with the Commonwealth Fund, they did a study looking at patients who thought that they had difficulty communicating with their physicians and the minority groups almost twi were almost twice as likely than white patients to think that they had difficulties communicating with their, with their physicians. And why is this important? If a patient can't communicate with you, they're not going to come back for follow-up. And even those who stick with you and, and come for follow-up, they may not follow your instructions. And when they looked at patients who did not follow doctor's instructions, the minority groups almost three times more likely than white patients to not follow instructions simply because they did not understand. So one of the, the solutions to the problem that has been proposed is to improve workforce diversity. Now when we look at the American Academy of Medical Colleges, <coughs> they did an estimation of which physicians were more likely to go and serve underserved areas. And you can see that all of the minorities are more likely to serve to work in underserved areas than white patients. So you might say, well, great. You know, they're minority physicians and they're going out to serve their own people, that's great. But are there enough of them? If we look at a recent breakdown of what the US physician population is by race, 68% of the population is white, less than 5% is African American, 19% is Asian, and less than 6% is, is Hispanic. And if we look at rates of graduation from medical school, 
up here we have white male physicians and white female physicians. And at the bottom here, all fighting for last place, we have African American and Hispanic physicians down here at the bottom. Now, you might say, why is it that we don't have more minorities or African Americans in medicine? Is it that they're not qualified or they're not interested? But again, we have to go back into history. In 1765, UPenn was the first medical school to be founded in the US. Now, at this time, slavery was in full practice. So needless to say, African Americans were not permitted admission into any medical school. In fact, education as a whole was denied to them. It wasn't until 1837 that the first African-American physician came into being in the US. And this was Dr. James McCune Smith. And at that time, even though he was a physician, he was not permitted entry into a US medical school. He had to, in fact, go to Scotland to the University of Glasgow in order to get his medical degree. The first African-American medical graduate was Dr. Samuel Ford McGill in 1839, and he graduated from Dartmouth Medical School. Now, from 1839 to 1868, it's estimated that about 40 African-American US physicians were trained in that time period. And it wasn't until Howard University opened their medical department that there was a significant area in which African-American physicians could be trained. Now, Howard did train a lot of African-American physicians, but they still weren't permitted membership or entry into the Amer American Medical Association. And at that time, that was often a criteria that was used for credentialing to be able to work in a hospital. So as a result, even though there were some physicians, they couldn't work in a lot of facilities and provide care. It wasn't until after the passage of the Civil Rights Act that the AME permitted membership to African-American physicians, and that sort of opened doors for them to be able to work in other healthcare institutions. So is SUNY Downstate pulling its weight? If we look at US medical schools with the highest rates of African-American graduates, Sudi Downstate is number seven on the list, which is not bad. And we've trained about, it's estimated to be about 207 African-American physicians. So even though we're not at the top of the list, we're still doing a pretty good job at it. And we do even more than that. We go even before medical school. There's a lot of work that's going on at the Brooklyn Health Disparity Center and the Arthur Ashe Institute of Urban Health. So they have a health science academy um, in which they have a STEM pipeline which focuses on involving minorities in science, technology, engineering, and math from middle school and high school. So they have an after school program that prepares students to enter the medical field. They also have a summer internship program which focuses on this as well and, and participants receive training in basic sciences. Um, they get exposure to the health sciences as well as learning research techniques. And there's also the PRIDE program, the program to increase diversity amongst individuals engaged in health-related research. And more recently, the transport program received a $10 million NIH grant in November 2017, which really seeks to increase the diversity and improve minorities who are working in health disparities research. So quite a bit is going on here at SUNY Downstate. And if we look at our internal medicine program, I must say that we do a pretty good job of, of widening the, the diversity within, within everyone at, at our program. I think you all look happy here. <laughs> but we can't limit ourselves to just treating patients that have the same backgrounds as us. And even if we do treat patients that have the same background as us, as we saw in that previous study with patients who were referred for cardiac cath, me having a black physician doesn't mean that my chances of getting a, being referred for a cath are any better because there are other factors that contribute to this. And unconscious bias is a big issue here. So as a result of that, we all need to become culturally competent. And this is the ability to interact effectively with people of different cultures. And it's twofold. On one hand, we need to have good self-awareness, be aware of our own personal beliefs and our unconscious bias, as well as developing an awareness, acceptance, and adaptation to cultural differences. And why is unconscious bias important? Because as I mentioned, on one hand, it affects your patient care, and then it also affects the way in which you recruit your workforce, as well as your daily interaction with colleagues. This was an interesting study done by Schumann. 
looking at the effect of race and sex on physicians' recommendations for cardiac cath. So what they did, they hired eight actors, two black males, two, two, two white males, two black females, two white females. And they had similar medical history, similar family history, similar presenting complaints, similar stress test results, and they did a videotaping of their cases. They then presented these to about 720 physicians at one of the ACP meetings and asked them which ones they would refer for cardiac cath based on their clinical assessments. And what they noticed is that women were less likely to be referred for cardiac cath and black patients as a whole were also less likely to be referred for cardiac cath. And one of the factors that they, they alluded to was that unconscious bias may have played a significant role in who was referred for cath because their clinical picture and their risks as w w were the same. So there are different methods of improving cultural competency. One of them, as we mentioned, was to have a diverse workforce, also the availability of translators, as well as web-based modules and workshops. Now, the American Academy of Medical Colleges has this tool here that they use to ask people how how much more culturally competent they thought they were after undergoing some of these training programs. And they thought that was a good measure of, of cultural competency. But in my opinion, that's not enough. It's really a measure of your patient outcomes and your patient satisfaction that you can measure cultural competency. Innovation and research has a significant role to play in, in narrowing the gap between the disparities about different races. Let's take, for instance, the US PTSF guidelines on prostate cancer screenings. So currently they recommend against screening for prostate cancer, right? But these guidelines were developed on the basis of examining two randomized control trials. Now let's look at those trials. The first one was a US-based study looking at prostate cancer screening in the randomized prostate, lung, colorectal, and ovarian cancer screening trial. And if you look at the baseline characteristics of the participants in that study, less than 5% of them were African-American. What was the other study? The other study was screening and prostate cancer mortality in a randomized European study. Now, I mean, they didn't go into a breakdown of what the research were in this study, but I'm sure you can extrapolate what it would have been. So, I mean, these are guidelines that are put out for the entire population, but yet the entire population isn't represented in the evidence that was used to develop them. But it's not all bad. The American College of Gastroenterology identified that there were differences in the disease pattern on colorectal cancer in African Americans. And as a result of that, the Committee of Minority Affairs and Cultural Diversity went about doing a systematic review of the evidence to really examine the disease pattern in African Americans. And what they noted was that African Americans presented at an earlier age with more advanced disease. And as a result of that, in 2009, they revamped their guidelines to suggest that screening in African Americans should begin at age 45 years. So this is just an example of the way that whatever research you do contributes to the pool of knowledge that can then be used to develop guidelines that affect patient care directly. And there are other success stories. For instance, in terms of the medications that we use to manage hypertension in African When she finishes with us in June, she will spend further training time at Mount Sinai Hospital by starting her fellowship in July in gastroenterology at the New York facility of Mount Sinai Hospital. Hospital. She's been recognized both as intern of the year at SUNY Downstate in internal medicine as well as been awarded resident of the year at Kings County Hospital. She would like us to derive from hearing her today an awareness of the areas in which racial health disparities are most dominant and may modify our treatment or the outcome of the patients of other races. And she would like us to be aware of the resources currently available to reduce racial health disparities impact. And to understand that there's a need for more research and we are 
ideally positioned at the downstate hospital complexes to do that kind of investigation and learn more about racial disparities and how they change what the med medical doctor can accomplish and does accomplish. Please join me in welcoming Dr. David today. Thank you, Dr. Friedman, for those warm, welcoming remarks. And thank you, everyone, for showing up to hear my talk. So as Dr. Friedman alluded to, today my talk will be on bridging the gap in racial healthcare disparities. What have we accomplished? So I have no financial disclosures. At the end of this talk, I'm hoping that we have a better understanding of what exactly health and healthcare disparities are what's our current state of racial healthcare disparities, what are the contributing factors to these disparities, an overview of the initiatives and what has been accomplished by them, and what is downstate's role in addressing healthcare disparities. Now, disparities in healthcare between different races first gained significant national attention from the US Department of Health in 1985 with the publishing of the Heckler Report which really sought to identify areas in which there were gaps between different races and set out a series of initiatives and, and objectives to improve that. Now, since that time, a number of agencies have all done similar things, where they've looked at information regarding healthcare disparities. And this has ranged from federal institutions to citywide institutions, to associations of different physicians which have all sought to identify these areas. And right here at Downstate, the Brooklyn Health Disparity Center, which is a collaboration between SUNY Downstate, the Arthur Ashe Institute of Urban Health, and the Brooklyn Borough Presidents, they have done quite a lot of work within our own communities regarding healthcare disparities. Now, Healthy People 2020 was developed by a federal interagency task force that gathered information from around the nation identified areas of priorities for health as the entire nation, as well as put for forward a 10-year plan of objectives that should be achieved. And one of their high priorities is really healthcare disparities amongst different races. Now these, these agencies all have different backgrounds, but they have one common agenda. And that agenda is to achieve health equity, eliminate disparities, and improve the health of all groups. So let's start off with some definitions. So a health disparity is a difference in the burden of illness, injury, disability, or mortality experienced by one population group relative to another. Now a health care disparity is a difference between groups in terms of health insurance coverage, access to, use of, and quality of care. And our goal, which is health equity, is the attainment of the highest level of health for all people through valuing everyone equally with societal efforts to address avoidable inequalities, historical and contemporary injustices, and the elimination of health and healthcare disparities. And this is not merely giving everybody the same equal resource, but rather identifying that different people have different needs and adjusting the resources that are allocated to them so that the outcome is what is the same. Now, there are different population characteristics in which disparities can exist. And this ranges from differences in language, geography, disability status, gender, sexual orientation, education, immigration, and socioeconomic status. But today's talk focuses on differences based on race or ethnicity. Now, if we're talking about race, let's see what our population looks like. So the most recent U.S. Census estimates that about 73% of the population identifies as being white, with the rest classified collectively as minorities. And of those, 12.6% are African American, 5.2% are Asian, and 3.1% are of mixed race. And if we look at ethnicity, currently 16.7% of the population identifies as being of Hispanic background. So one of the most basic ways in which we can assess a population's health is to look at their life expectancy. So let me ask you a question. What is the estimated difference in life expectancy between whites and African Americans? No music today? No music? Okay. <laughs> All right, 
So let's take a look. So if we look at an estimate of trends from 1999 to 2013, these are white patients up here on this blue line, this black patients down here on the black line. And in 1999, it was estimated that the difference in years was actually about six years. And that has narrowed somewhat, and more recent estimates in 2013 estimate that gap to be about 3.6 years. Now you might say 3.6 years, that doesn't sound too terrible. That's like Obama living to 87 and Trump living to 90, which may or may not be bad depending on how you look at it. <laughs> but let's take it in a different perspective. Let's go on a subway, a subway ride. Let's go on the three and the four line and do some traveling. So over here in Brownsville, 76% of the population is African American and their life expectancy is 74.1 years. If we go next door in Crown Heights, the population is 64% African American with a life expectancy of 77 years. And if we hop across to Park Slope, where 10% of the population is African American and the life expectancy goes up to 80.3 years. And once we cross the East River to the financial district on Upper East Side, where less than 5% of the population is African American, the life expectancy goes up to 85 years. So if we compare Brownsville over here, so the Upper East Side and the financial district, that's actually 11 years different in life expectancy in just like a 30 minute commute. Paradoxically, however, if you look at East Flatbush, 89% of the population is African American and the life expectancy there is 82 years. I can't help but sort of assume and extrapolate that maybe downstate in Kings County has something to do with that. <laughs> so what are the, the diseases that contribute the most to this mortality disparity? So even though it's narrowing, the diseases that still account for most of the disparities that are observed are heart disease, cancer, and HIV disease. And if we look at trends in death from cardiovascular disease by race, over a 10 year period it has narrowed from about a gap of 100 to 100,000 in 2004 to a gap of about 70 in 2014. Let's think of this in a clinical context. So a 59 year old uninsured African American woman with a rejection fraction of 25% presents to the emergency department for the fourth time this month with a CHF exacerbation. She has not had any workup to determine the etiology of her CHF. She has no usual PCP, but she reports adherence with the following meds. So she's on Lasix, metoprolol, lisinopril, and spironolactone. Which of the following are health disparity factors that contribute to her morbidity and her expected higher mortality? Now, there isn't necessarily a right answer here, but I'm just trying to assess where your headspace might be. So have fun. I'm missing the music. at all, not bad at all. So if we start off by looking at risk factors that contribute to these disparities in, in cardiovascular disease, I'm looking at two graphs from Healthy People 2020, and they always put out a set of goals, a target for the population, which is always identified along this red dashed line for all of the graphs. So over here for hypertension, the goal is to have about 27% of your population, and no more than that, having hypertension but African-Americans here in orange consistently have higher rates of hypertension even over a 10 year period, whereas white patients here in blue are pretty much at target. Now this graph over here is very busy, but I want to draw your attention to this blue line here, which, rec which represents African-Americans, compared to this yellowish line here, which rep represents white patients. And these are cases of new, epi new cases of diabetes mellitus. And you can see that African-Americans have significantly higher rates of developing diabetes compared with white patients. So let's put risk factors aside and look at the care that patients receive. So this is a study done by Chen et al. in 2001 in which they looked at the rate of use of cardiac cath after an acute myocardial infarction. And they were looking to see if there was any difference between having a white physician or a black physician. 
And what they found was that regardless of what the background of your physician was, black patients, for whatever reason, were less likely to have received a cardiac cath than white patients. Whether this was a measure of whether it was recommended or whether the patients complied, they weren't able to actually identify what the root cause of it was. Now let's talk a little bit about cancer. We have another case. So a 56-year-old African-American gentleman presents to your primary care practice to establish care. As part of his preventative care, he asked about screening for prostate cancer. What's the discussion that we have with him? So that we tell him that current guidelines recommend against screening for prostate cancer, or that most men with prostate cancer die of something else, and the risks associated with screening outweigh the potential benefits? Or do we tell him that, yes, prostate cancer has has risk, but he may be at a higher risk of prostate cancer incidence and mortality, or do you just go ahead and order the PSA? Again, not necessarily a right answer, but let me just see what you're thinking. So if we look at incidence of cancer, all cancers as a whole, between races, we can see that black men have a higher incidence of cancer than all of the other races, whereas white women, black women, sorry, have a slightly lower incidence than other races for all cancers. But when we look at mortality, however, both black men and black women have higher rates of mortality than any of the other races. So the top four fatal cancers are lung, breast, colorectal, and prostate cancer. Let's see how the races stack up for those four. So this is lung cancer, and again, this is the target set by healthy people, this red dashed line. And African Americans are here on this blue line, and white patients are on the red line. And you can see they're pretty much together and at, and at goal for what Healthy People 2020 has outlined. But let's take a look at breast cancer. Again, black patients are all the way up here compared to white patients down here who are pretty much at the goal for Healthy People 2020. For prostate cancer, a similar picture is seen here with black patients up here on this blue line and white patients down here below the target for Healthy People 2020. And for colorectal cancer mortality, again, the same pattern pervades. So for three out of the four top fatal cancers, African Americans have higher rates of mortality. Now let's talk a little bit about HIV. No question here, but just think about it again. So Miss Ellen is a 45-year-old African-American woman admitted to the MICU with cryptococcal meningitis. Chart review shows that she had a positive HIV test two years prior, but since then has had no documentation of attending the HIV clinic. On regaining her mental status, you ask her, why, why didn't you ever go for care? And she says, antiretrovirals are another one of those government guinea pig experiments. Now, are her concerns unfounded? Do they have any foundation? Now, when patients do not feel or trust antiretrovirals, they won't take them. As a result, they have lower rates of viral suppression, higher rates of transmission, and of course, higher mortality. And that's exactly what we see over here. Black patients have over almost four times the rates of transmission of new cases of HIV compared with the rest of the population. And in terms of mortality, these two lines are both African American men of different ages, whereas these two lines are white men of different ages. And I don't need to explain this graph, it's clearly different. So what? You might say, well, this is just a minority of the population. So as a population as a whole, we're probably not doing too badly off, right? But if we look at where the population is projected to go over the next 40 years or so, so the blue line represents the estimation in 2060, whereas the green line represents where we are currently. And you can see that minorities in 2060 as a whole are projected to creep into the majority. So that's a larger proportion of your population that will be experiencing lower, poorer healthcare outcomes. And what about the cost? Everybody likes dollars and cents. How much does it cost? What do you think?
close. So it's, oops, so it's estimated that $35 billion per year is spent in excess healthcare expenditures due to racial healthcare disparities. And that does not take into consideration the excess $10 billion that's lost in productivity or the $200 billion that are lost in premature deaths. So what are the contributing factors for racial healthcare disparities? The so there, uh, there are a number of factors, it's very multifactorial. So it's a combination of social factors, genetics, and behavior. And the talk today really focuses on the impact of health services on racial healthcare disparities. So what, can, what impact can be made by targeting health services? The Kelly Report was a report done by the, Black Congress, the Congressional Black Caucus Movement in which they identified a few key areas that have to be addressed within healthcare in order to reduce disparities. And they focused on federal action, access, workforce diversity, innovation and research, and community engagement. So federal action has the potential to impact all of those other areas. It can directly impact access to coverage, access to healthcare, your workforce, research funding, as well as funding for community programs. Let's take a walk through history and see how federal action has impacted racial healthcare disparities. In 1877, this was not too long after the abolition of slavery, the Jim Crow laws came into effect. And these were a series of laws in the south of, of the US which mandated segregation at all public facilities. So as a result of that, there were many, many facilities in which African Americans could not access care in any form. So of course there was opposition to this. And in 1896, there was a big trial, but there was a Supreme Court ruling in the Plessy versus Ferguson trial that upheld racial segregation laws for public facilities as long as they had equal quality. Who was monitoring the quality? Needless to say, there was no quality monitoring. So African Americans, were, if they had any facilities at all, were of always a poorer quality. Now in 1946, the Hill-Burton Act was passed. And this was an act that increased public funding to improve the number of hospitals and healthcare facilities that were available. And there was some outcry that federal funds should not be used for, for segregated facilities. So the Hill-Burton Act said, you know what, we don't want you to discriminate, but if you have separate but equal facilities, it's okay. Needless to say, no one again was monitoring the quality of these, these facilities. It wasn't until 1964 when the Civil Rights Act was passed that discrimination in institutions was outright outlawed. And if you received any federal assistance, you could not have discrimination in your facilities. A year later, this was compounded by the Medicare and Medicaid Act in which facilities had to comply with the Civil Rights Act in order to receive reimbursement. And moving forward to 2010, the Affordable Care Act was passed, which improved rates of insurance for all persons. So that's just a way in which you can see how federal action can either hurt racial healthcare disparities, or it can really help and have a significant impact. Now, what about access to care? Access to care can be thought as in terms of having access to insurance coverage, as well as having access to a usual source of care or having a medical home. In terms of access to medical care, the impact that Medicare, Medicaid, and Affordable Care Act has had on insurance, on insurance rates is really significant. So for a population as a whole, on insurance rates went from 25 to about 15% after Medicare and Medicaid was instituted, and then it further dropped after the Affordable Care Act was passed from about 16% to about 9%. So it improved on insurance rates for everyone. And if we look at the impact of the Affordable Care Act, on, on insurance rates between races. White patients are down here in purple and they benefited their rates of an uninsurance went from to about 16% to 9%. But the drop in, in uninsurance rates for African Americans went from just about 28% to almost half, almost 14.5%. So the Affordable Care Act has improved access in terms of insurance coverage for African Americans significantly. Now what about having a usual source of care or um, having a medical home? 
This was a study done by the Commonwealth Fund in 2006 in which they looked at the ability of patients to be able to access care when they needed it if they had a set medical home. Now patients in the navy blue columns, those are patients that have a set medical home. And whenever they needed care, they were almost equally able to access care when it was needed. However, amongst patients that don't have a medical home or a usual source of care, when they needed to have care, white patients were more likely than African-American patients or Hispanic patients to be able to get care from anywhere else if they didn't have a set medical home. Now, what are the factors that contributed to this? So, as I was mentioning, there was clear racial segregation in healthcare facilities. Now, this is a picture from a hospital dispensary in Washington, D.C. in the 1950s. And over here, you can see there's a colored men's waiting room and a white men's waiting room. Now, this is probably one of those facilities that was considered to be a mixed race facility in which they provided care for both races, but in separate areas. So just as how they have separate waiting rooms, they probably had separate treatment wards. And often it was the case that wards that serviced African-Americans were either in the basement or the attic or somewhere that was not as well developed as those that served white patients. The other facilities that were around were those that just outright did not admit African-Americans. And then there were some facilities that were integrated. In 1956, a study was done on segregation and discrimination in medical care in the United States. And if we look at hospitals in the North, 82.5% of them were integrated at that point in time. But in the South, less than 6% of facilities were integrated at that point in time. So there were there was, you know, there was really no place that African Americans in the South can really access care readily. So what drove the end of segregation in the healthcare system? So as I was mentioning, in, the, in 1964, the Civil Rights Act prohibited discrimination in institutions that received federal funding. But some of the federal institutions, as well as all of the private institutions, only 49% of them complied a year within a, after assessing them after a year. It wasn't until 1965 when Medicare and Medicaid came on board where no hospital could receive any reimbursement unless they complied with the Civil Rights Act that 100% of the facilities complied. So those are the efforts of, of federal action that sought to improve access to care for all persons. But what about physician-driven efforts? I wanted to highlight, highlight Dr. Robert Smith, who was a physician in Mississippi in the 1940s, 1950s. And he founded the Medical Committee for Human Rights, which then went on to become the medical arm of the civil rights movement. Now, their role at that time was to really drive a lot of the policy changes in the Civil Rights Act that improved access for all patients. As well as on a more hands-on level, they treated a lot of the injuries sustained by people who were involved in the civil rights movement who were victims of violence from other members in society as well as law enforcement agencies. He further went on to found the nation's first desegregated rural community health center in Mississippi in 1964, and then further went on to conceptualize and, and write the proposal for federally qualified health centers that we know today. This is him in 2017, just last year, receiving the AMA Medal of Valor, because his actions during the civil rights movement would have actually been of physical, could have potentially been of, of physical harm to him. Now, there were also physician-driven physician efforts as a group. Now, this is the National Medical Association that I actually hadn't really heard of before researching for this presentation. And this is an organization of African-American physicians that was formed because the American Medical Association did not permit membership to African-Americans before the late 1960s. So not only were they advocating for their own membership, this is them here picketing outside one of the American Medical Association's conventions for themselves, but they were also very instrumental in the Civil Rights Act and protesting and, and mobilizing to improve social justice for all, all persons. So where are we 50 years later? Have we gotten anywhere? So again, looking at healthy people's estimates, um, this, this chart is looking at persons who have a usual primary care provider. So again, this is what Healthy People 2020, that's their target. And in this fluorescent green line over here, you have 
white patients, and they're not quite at the target, but they're closer. Whereas down here in yellow, you have African Americans who are significantly less likely to have a usual primary care provider, and Hispanics are all the way at the bottom. So what's been done? So HRSA, the Health Resources and Service Administration, has developed a series of health centers across the nation. And these are the children of the federal, federally qualified health centers that Dr. Robert Smith founded. And NYC Health and Hospitals, as well as the Institute for Family Health, those are the New York organizations that fall under that umbrella. And they are making significant inroads in terms of servicing persons who otherwise would not get care. And between 2001 to 2016, the number of patients that are serviced by HUSA have increased from 10.3 million to 26 million. So they are making quite a significant impact in servicing people. And if you look at the makeup of people who are serviced by NYC HHC, approximately 92% of the population, all of these here, all of these constitute minority populations. So I must say that we are making a significant impact in providing care to, to minority patients that otherwise would not be able to. Now, one of the other areas that was identified in terms of reducing healthcare disparities is in workforce diversity and cultural competency. Why is this important? A survey that was done by the Commonwealth Fund in 2002 asked patients if they thought that they would have received a better quality of care had they been of a different race. And you can see that all of the minorities, African Americans, Hispanics, and Asians, a lot more of them thought that the care that they would have received would have been different if they were of another race. What are some of the factors contributing to this perception? So again, we have to go back into history and examine mistrust of the healthcare system. Now this goes as far back as slavery days. So this is Dr. Sims, Dr. Sims of the speculum and the examination position. And it's documented that he did a number of experiments on slaves without their consent. In fact, his, his, his procedure for, for correcting vesicle vaginal fistulas was perfected on three slave women before he even started going on to treat white patients. More recently, the Tuskegee syphilis experiment, which is well documented, was not just an, an initiative by a random physician in a back alley somewhere, but this was a federally funded, CDC-driven study in which penicillin was deliberately withheld from African Americans in order to study the natural history of syphilis. And Henrietta Lacks in 1951, she was an African American lady who had cervical cancer and sought care at Johns Hopkins Hospital. And while there, she had some of her cervical cancer cells removed and used to generate the first immortal cell line culture. Now, because of that, a number of health discoveries that have affected everybody have been discovered. But the problem here is that it was done completely without her consent, and her family was never informed. In addition to mistrust of the healthcare system, problems with communication are also an issue. Again, with the Commonwealth Fund, they did a study looking at patients who thought that they had difficulty communicating with their physicians. And the minority groups almost twi were almost twice as likely than white patients to think that they had difficulties communicating with their, with their physicians. And why is this important? If a patient can't communicate with you, they're not going to come back for follow-up. And even those who stick with you and, and come for follow-up, they may not follow your instructions. And when they looked at patients who did not follow doctor's instructions, the minority groups almost three times more likely than white patients to not follow instructions simply because they did not understand. So one of the, the solutions to the problem that has been proposed is to improve workforce diversity. Now when we look at the American Academy of Medical Colleges, <clears throat> they did an estimation of which physicians were more likely to go and serve underserved areas. And you can see that all of the minorities are more likely to serve to work in underserved areas than white patients. So you might say, well, great. You know, they're minority physicians and they're going out to serve their own people, that's great. But are there enough of them? If we look at a recent breakdown of what the US physician population is by race, 68% of the population is white, less than 5% is African American, 19% is Asian, and less than 6% is, is Hispanic. And if we look at rates of graduation from medical school, 
up here we have white male physicians and white female physicians. And at the bottom here, all fighting for last place, we have African American and Hispanic physicians down here at the bottom. Now, you might say, why is it that we don't have more minorities or African Americans in medicine? Is it that they're not qualified or they're not interested? But again, we have to go back into history. In 1765, UPenn was the first medical school to be founded in the US. Now, at this time, slavery was in full practice. So needless to say, African Americans were not permitted admission into any medical school. In fact, education as a whole was denied to them. It wasn't until 1837 that the first African-American physician came into being in the US. And this was Dr. James McCune Smith. And at that time, even though he was a physician, he was not permitted entry into a US medical school. He had to, in fact, go to Scotland to the University of Glasgow in order to get his medical degree. The first African-American medical graduate was Dr. Samuel Ford McGill in 1839, and he graduated from Dartmouth Medical School. Now, from 1839 to 1868, it's estimated that about 40 African-American US physicians were trained in that time period. And it wasn't until Howard University opened their medical department that there was a significant area in which African-American physicians could be trained. Now, Howard did train a lot of African-American physicians, but they still weren't permitted membership or entry into the Amer American Medical Association. And at that time, that was often a criteria that was used for credentialing to be able to work in a hospital. So as a result, even though there were some physicians, they couldn't work in a lot of facilities and provide care. It wasn't until after the passage of the Civil Rights Act that the AMA permitted membership to African-American physicians, and that sort of opened doors for them to be able to work in other healthcare institutions. So is SUNY Downstate pulling its weight? If we look at US medical schools with the highest rates of African-American graduates, SUNY Downstate is number seven on the list, which is not bad. And we've trained about, it's estimated to be about 207 African-American physicians. So even though we're not at the top of the list, we're still doing a pretty good job at it. And we do even more than that. We go even before medical school. There's a lot of work that's going on at the Brooklyn Health Disparity Center and the Arthur Ashe Institute of Urban Health. So they have a health science academy um, in which they have a STEM pipeline which focuses on involving minorities in science, technology, engineering, and math from middle school and high school. So they have an after school program that prepares students to enter the medical field. They also have a summer internship program which focuses on this as well and, and participants receive training in basic sciences. Um, they get exposure to the health sciences as well as learning research techniques. And there's also the PRIDE program, the program to increase diversity amongst individuals engaged in health-related research. And more recently, the transport program received a $10 million NIH grant in November 2017, which really seeks to increase the diversity and improve minorities who are working in health disparities research. So quite a bit is going on here at SUNY Downstate. And if we look at our internal medicine program, I must say that we do a pretty good job of, of widening the, the diversity within, within everyone at, at our program. I think we all look happy here. <laughs> but we can't limit ourselves to just treating patients that have the same backgrounds as us. And even if we do treat patients that have the same background as us, as we saw in that previous study with patients who were referred for cardiac calf, me having a black physician doesn't mean that my chances of getting a, being referred for a calf are any better, because there are other factors that contribute to this. And unconscious bias is a big issue here. So as a result of that, we all need to become culturally competent. And this is the ability to interact effectively with people of different cultures. And it's twofold. On one hand, we need to have good self-awareness, be aware of our own personal beliefs and our unconscious bias, as well as developing an awareness, acceptance, and adaptation to cultural differences. And why is unconscious bias important? Because as I mentioned, on one hand, it affects your patient care, and then it also affects the way in which you recruit your workforce, as well as your daily interaction with colleagues. This was an interesting study done by Schulman. 
looking at the effect of race and sex on physicians' recommendations for cardiac cath. So what they did, they hired eight actors, two black males, two, two, two white males, two black females, two white females. And they had similar medical history, similar family history, similar presenting complaints, similar stress test results, and they did a videotaping of their cases. They then presented these to about 720 physicians at one of the ACP meetings and asked them which ones they would refer for cardiac cath based on their clinical assessment. And what they noticed is that women were less likely to be referred for cardiac cath and black patients as a whole were also less likely to be referred for cardiac cath. And one of the factors that they, they alluded to was that unconscious bias may have played a significant role in who was referred for cath because their clinical picture and their risks as w w were the same. So there are different methods of improving cultural competency. One of them, as we mentioned, was to have a diverse workforce, also the availability of translators, as well as web-based modules and workshops. Now, the American Academy of Medical Colleges has this tool here that they use to ask people how how much more culturally competent they thought they were after undergoing some of these training programs. And they thought that was a good measure of, of cultural competency. But in my opinion, that's not enough. It's really a measure of your patient outcomes and your patient satisfaction that you can measure cultural competency. Innovation and research has a significant role to play in, in narrowing the gap between the disparities about different races. Let's take, for instance, the US PTSF guidelines on prostate cancer screenings. So currently they recommend against screening for prostate cancer, right? But these guidelines were developed on the basis of examining two randomized controlled trials. Now let's look at those trials. The first one was a US-based study looking at prostate cancer screening in the randomized prostate, lung, colorectal, and ovarian cancer screening trial. And if you look at the baseline characteristics of the participants in that study, less than 5% of them were African-American. What was the other study? The other study was screening and prostate cancer mortality in a randomized European study. Now, I mean, they didn't go into a breakdown of what the research went to study, but I'm sure you can extrapolate what it would have been. So, I mean, these are guidelines that are put out for the entire population, but yet the entire population isn't represented in the evidence that was used to develop them. But it's not all bad. The American College of Gastroenterology identified that there were differences in the disease pattern on colorectal cancer in African Americans. And as a result of that, the Committee of Minority Affairs and Cultural Diversity went about doing a systematic review of the evidence to really examine the disease pattern in African Americans. And what they noted was that African Americans presented at an earlier age with more advanced disease. And as a result of that, in 2009, they revamped their guidelines to suggest that screening in African Americans should begin at age 45 years. So this is just an example of the way that whatever research you do contributes to the pool of knowledge that can then be used to develop guidelines that affect patient care directly. And there are other success stories. For instance, in terms of the medications that we use to manage hypertension in African Americans is different, as well as the medications that have better mortality in heart failure in African Americans is also different as a result of the efforts and the studies that have been done in these populations. In view of this, the NIH has, has developed a subgroup, a subcommittee called the National Institute on Minority Health and Health Disparities. And they have various focuses with a focus on clinical and health sciences research, integrative biological and behavioral research with special efforts in terms of precision medicine, which seeks to develop treatments that are targeted to individuals, as well as community health and population sciences. What is Downstate doing? So there's so much going on at Downstate, I could not represent everybody, so I just took a few snippets of research that's a, that, that, that has been published and made significant impacts in the past. So Americans is different, as well as the medications that have better mortality in heart failure in African Americans is also different as a result of the efforts and the studies that have been done in these populations. In view of this, the NIH has, has developed a subgroup, a subcommittee called the National Institute on Minority Health and Health Disparities. 
and they have various focuses with a focus on clinical and health sciences research, integrative biological and behavioral research with special efforts in terms of precision medicine, which seeks to develop treatments that are targeted to individuals, as well as community health and population sciences. What is Downstate doing? So there's so much going on at Downstate, I could not represent everybody, so I just took a few snippets of research that, that, that has been published and made significant impacts in the past. So Dr. Banerjee's description of diabetic ketoacidosis in non-insulin dependent diabetes, which led to the terminology flatbush diabetes, something developed here at Downstate that directly affects minorities. Dr. Ginsler's study on microphenolid mofetil versus IV cyclophosphamide for lupus nephritis. And Dr. Weiner's study that's going on as well, looking at a 10 year analysis of metastatic prostate cancer as an initial presentation in our population. So these are all different studies that are going on that study our population and add to that pool of knowledge that will be beneficial in developing. Dr. Banerjee's description of diabetic ketoacidosis in non-insulin dependent diabetes, which led to the terminology flatbush diabetes, something developed here at Downstate that directly affects minorities. Dr. Ginsler's study on microphenolid mofetil versus IV cyclophosphamide for lupus nephritis. And Dr. Weiner's study that's going on as well, looking at a 10 year analysis of metastatic prostate cancer as an initial presentation in our population. So these are all different studies that are going on that study our population and add to that pool of knowledge that will be beneficial in developing targeted guidelines. This is currently the third year of the annual Cancer Health Disparity Symposium hosted here at SUNY Downstate. And it's a collaboration between the Brooklyn Health Disparity Center, Stony Brook University, Downstate and Cold Spring Harbor. And other things that are going on as well are the Women's Interagency HIV Study at, through, the, through the Star Clinic. And I'm currently working on a collaborative paper with Stony Brook University looking at the impact of diabetes mellitus on the prevalence of colorectal adenomas at three institutions, comparing Downstate, Kings County, and Stony Brook. And there's some interesting research going on in the, in the GI department. This is currently the third year of the annual Cancer Health Disparity Symposium hosted here at SUNY Downstate. And it's a collaboration between the Brooklyn Health Disparity Center, Stony Brook University, Downstate, and Cold Spring Harbor. And other things that are going on as well are the Women's Interagency HIV Study at, through, the, through the Star Clinic. And I'm currently working on a collaborative paper with Stony Brook University looking at the impact of diabetes mellitus on the prevalence of colorectal adenomas at three institutions, comparing Downstate, Kings County, and Stony Brook. And there's some interesting research going on in the, in the GI department as well, in which they seek to reduce disparities in generating human cancer models, in which they are generating pancreatic organoids in from pancreatic cancer samples from our population here. Because if you look at organoid banks across the country, African Americans are significantly underrepresented there. And we can't get anywhere without community engagement. These are two systematic reviews, which have department as well, in which they seek to reduce disparities in generating human cancer models, in which they are generating pancreatic organoids in from pancreatic cancer samples from our population here. Because if you look at organoid banks across the country, African Americans are significantly underrepresented there. And we can't get anywhere without community engagement. These are two systematic reviews which have looked at the impact of community engagement and it consistently shows that this improves rates of patient engagement, behavioral change and patient satisfaction once we engage within the community. Community engagement has various steps to it. So first we need to think about what we think the problems are. And then we need to go into the community and identify and engage stakeholders. We need to define our community, collect and analyze data, prioritize community health issues, document these results, plan and implement these strategies, and then go back and think about it all over again. Now, two of the key areas in which we have to pay attention to when we of community engagement, and it consistently shows that this improves rates of patient engagement behavioral change, and patient satisfaction once we engage within the community. Community engagement has various steps to it. So first we need to think about what we think the problems are, 
And then we need to go into the community and identify and engage stakeholders. We need to define our community, collect and analyze data, prioritize community health issues, document these results, plan and implement these strategies, and then go back and think about it all over again. Now, two of the key areas in which we have to pay attention to when we're doing community engagement is really identifying and engaging stakeholders within the community and finding out what are their priorities. Now, we do a really good job at that at the Brooklyn Health Disparities Center with their community-based participatory research where they go into the community and identify key stakeholders there. Two of their, of their programs that they have done have involved barbershops, which I found was particularly interesting. So over in this study, they went into barbershops and educated barbers about HIV and then used them to be, to be health advocates to teach their clients in terms of HIV prevention, HIV testing, and also in doing community engagement is really identifying and engaging stakeholders within the community and finding out what are their priorities. Now, we do a really good job at that at the Brooklyn Health Disparities Center with their community-based participatory research where they go into the community and identify key stakeholders there. Two of their, of their programs that they have done have involved barbershops, which I found was particularly interesting. So over in this study, they went into barbershops and educated barbers about HIV and then used them to be, to be health advocates to teach their clients in terms of HIV prevention, HIV testing, and also in terms of recruiting patients for colorectal cancer screening, the Mr. B trial again went into barbershops and used this as a point to, to identify people who would have otherwise never come to us for colorectal cancer screening. The Mr. B trial again went into barbershops and used this as a point to, to identify people who would have otherwise never come to us for us to refer them for colorectal cancer screening. And these have all resulted in, in very positive outcomes. Other things that are going on in terms of community outreach at Downstate. Ms. Betty Jum, one of our RNs who, who's in, who works with our Center of Community Health Promotion and Wellness, gave me quite a bit of information about what they're doing in terms of colorectal, breast, and cervical cancer screening. So any patients that have no insurance or uninsured, she actually goes out into the community, into health fairs, senior centers, religious organizations, and recruits for us to refer them for colorectal cancer screening. And these have all resulted in, in very positive outcomes. Other things that are going on in terms of community outreach at Downstate. Ms. Betty Jum, one of our RNs who, who's in, who works with our Center of Community Health Promotion and Wellness, gave me quite a bit of information about what they're doing in terms of colorectal, breast, and cervical cancer screening. So any patients that have no insurance or uninsured, she actually goes out into the community, into health fairs, senior centers, religious organizations, and recruits patients to participate in free cancer screenings. And some of the data she shared is that with the implementation of this program, as well as others like the Citywide Colon Cancer Coalition, colon cancer screening rates have improved from about 35% in African Americans in 2003 to just under 70% in, in more recent estimates. There's also the Cardiac Screening Center, which on Wednesdays they provide free screening for hypertension, diabetes, and hyperlipidemia in an effort to reduce the risk factors associated with colorectal cancer screening. And there's also the Community Health Mobile Network. So there's a lot of work that's being done here at Dodsey to really engage the community and, and, and get participate in free cancer screenings. And some of the data she shared is that with the implementation of this program, as well as others like the Citywide Colon Cancer Coalition, colon cancer screening rates have improved from about 35% in African Americans in 2003 to just under 70% in, in more recent estimates. There's also the Cardiac Screening Center, which on Wednesdays they provide free screening for hypertension, diabetes, and hyperlipidemia in an effort to reduce the risk factors associated with colorectal cancer screening. And there's also the Community Health Mobile Network. So there's a lot of work that's being done here at Dodsey to really engage the community and, and, and get positive benefits from it. At the Arthur Ashe Institute, we also have Heart of a Woman and Breast Cancer Screening. And one of the success stories that they referred to was a hairdresser who was engaged as part of this program, who discussed with one of her clients how to do breast cancer screening. And she further went on to be able to 
um, to a self-breast exam and detected an early lump, which led to early detection of cancer. So they were able to directly engage the community in this way. And at the Star Clinic, there's the Adolescent Education Program, which engages teens to discuss HIV and HIV awareness with their peers. And our residents are doing it too. We're starting in with baby steps, but this is some of the positive benefits from it. At the Arthur Ashe Institute, we also have Heart of a Woman and Breast Cancer Screening. And one of the success stories that they referred to was a hairdresser who was engaged as part of this program, who discussed with one of her clients how to do breast cancer screening. And she further went on to be able to do um, a self-breast exam and detected an early lump, which led to early detection of cancer. So they were able to directly engage the community in this way. And at the Star Clinic, there's the Adolescent Education Program, which engages teens to discuss HIV and HIV awareness with their peers. And our residents are doing it too. We're starting in with baby steps, but this is some of the residents from the primary care practice at Kings County who all jumped into a police van and went around the community so that they had a better awareness of where their patients come from and what resources are available to them. And then sat down with some of the community leaders, this is Professor Green from the Crown Heights Community um, Outreach Center, and identified with them what are the issues in the community. So we've accomplished some, but where do we go from here? So these are just, this is just my opinion. This is not necessarily what healthy people or anybody has put forward. But in terms of access to care, We've, done significant, we've made significant inroads in terms of improving insurance, but we need to find some way to ensure those patients who are undocumented. Whether people like them or not, the undocumented patients are here, and there are a large proportion of those patients who are the residents from the primary care practice at Kings County, who all jumped into a police van and went around the community so that they had a better awareness of where their patients come from and what resources are available to them. And then sat down with some of the community leaders, this is Professor Green from the Crown Heights Community um, Outreach Center, and identified with them what are the issues in the community. So we've accomplished some, but where do we go from here? So these are just, this is just my opinion. This is not necessarily what healthy people or anybody has put forward. But in terms of access to care, We've done significant, we've made significant inroads in terms of improving insurance, but we need to find some way to ensure those patients who are undocumented. Whether people like them or not, the undocumented patients are here, and there are a large proportion of those patients who, are, who do not get quality care. We also need more patient-centered medical homes, because patients, it's hard to get them in, and once we get them there, we need to try to get all the services coordinated with them. And it shouldn't just be isolated to safety net institutions. I think all institutions should have a cohort of patients or a quota in which they have to serve underserved patients. We need to do more work in terms of workforce diversity, not in terms of preferential hiring, but really in terms of mentoring and preparing and motivating other minority students to enter the health professions. We need to develop new models for cultural competency because those web-based modules had limited impact on me and I'm, in sh I'm sure for everybody else as well. We need to do research from scientific research to quality improvement to every case report you write adds to a case series which can then help outline disease patterns in different, in different populations. And we need to do more community engagement at every stage of our medical career. So as a physician, what can we all do? We can work in an underserved area, make their biggest impact there. Engage your community and be aware of their history. We need to let go of our own agendas and find out what they need. We need to be mindful of our own biases and how it affects others. We need to build trust because we can't get anywhere in terms of getting patients to come to us or participate in research. We need to know our guidelines, but also know who do not get quality care. We also need more patient-centered medical homes because patients, it's hard to get them in, and once we get them there, we need to try to get all the services coordinated with them. And it shouldn't just be isolated to safety net institutions. I think all institutions should have a cohort of patients or a quota in which they have to serve underserved patients. We need to do more work in terms of workforce diversity not in terms of preferential hiring, but really in terms of mentoring and preparing and motivating other minority students to enter the health professions. We need to develop new models for cultural competency because those web-based modules had limited impact on me and I'm, I'm sure for everybody else as well. We need to do research 
from scientific research to quality improvement to every case report you write adds to a case series, which can then help outline disease patterns in different, in different populations. And we need to do more communica community engagement at every stage of our medical career. So as a physician, what can we all do? We can work in an underserved area, make their biggest impact there. Engage your community and be aware of their history. We need to let go of our own agendas and find out what they need. We need to be mindful of our own biases and how it affects others. We need to build trust because we can't get anywhere in terms of getting patients to come to us or participate in research. We need to know our guidelines but also know their limitations. We need to document our observations and conduct ethical research. And in addition to that, we need to write to our political leaders and lobby for our patients. So in summary, racial disparities in healthcare still exist. They have heavy costs in terms of patient outcomes and expenditure, and we as physicians can be powerful drivers to mitigate these disparities. I would just like to acknowledge a couple of people, both faculty, people from the Arthur Ashe Institute, from the Brooklyn Health Disparities Center. Thank you all for helping me with this presentation and your contributions and their limitations. We need to document our observations and conduct ethical research. And in addition to that, we need to write to our political leaders and lobby for our patients. So in summary, racial disparities in healthcare still exist. They have heavy costs in terms of patient outcomes and expenditure, and we as physicians can be powerful drivers to mitigate these disparities. I would just like to acknowledge a couple of people, both faculty, people from the Arthur Ashe Institute, from the Brooklyn Health Disparities Center. Thank you all for helping me with this presentation and your contributions and the work that you do still. And I just wanted to end with this quote from Martin Luther, Dr. Martin Luther King at one of the speeches he gave to the Medical Committee for Human Rights. Of all the forms of inequality, injustice in healthcare is the most shocking and inhumane. Let's continue our efforts to put an end to this. Thank you. I do still. And I just wanted to end with this quote from Martin Luther, Dr. Martin Luther King at one of the speeches he gave to the Medical Committee for Human Rights. Of all the forms of inequality, Injustice in healthcare is the most shocking and inhumane. Let's continue our efforts to put an end to this. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. David. May I remind the faculty, please, that there is a department faculty meeting immediately at the conclusion. Thank you, Dr. David. May I remind the faculty, please, that there is a department faculty meeting immediately at the conclusion of Grand Rapids. Rounds at 9.30. Dr. Salafo, please. Thank you very much. This was fantastic. I really enjoyed it. And although I'm in the area. Rounds at 9.30. Dr. Salafo, please. Thank you very much. This was fantastic. I really enjoyed it. And although I'm in the area of health disparities, I learned a lot this morning uh, from what you said. Uh, so the first thing I'm going to request from you is to request a review paper. I need that paper on my desk on Monday morning. We have health disparities. I learned a lot this morning uh, from what you said. Uh, so the first thing I'm going to request from you is to request a review paper. I need that paper on my desk on Monday morning. <laughs> Can you do that? You try, okay. The, the comment I have is um, anyone who actually works in this environment, the resident, can you do that? We'll, we'll try. You try, okay. The, the comment I have is um, anyone who actually works in this environment, the residents, the students, uh, you know, the attendings, the uh, staff, anyone working at Kings County Hospital Downs is really, really uh, very vested in health disparities because that's what we do. The students, uh, you know, the attendings, the uh, staff, anyone working at Kings County Hospital Downs is really, really uh, very vested in health disparities because that's what we do. So I would really like to thank all the audience, all the people here. I know it is in your heart. I know that they came here because they want to serve the underserved and that's really remarkable. Uh, but I'd like to thank all the audience, all the people here. I know it is in your heart. I know that they came here because they want to serve the underserved, and that is really remarkable. Uh, but Downstate really uh, came to the light 
first because of, for, uh, for, uh, of course you said that. But I really want to recognize Dr. La Rosa. He's in the audience. Dr. La Rosa, I was really uh, came to the light first because of, for, uh, for, uh, of course you said that. But I really want to recognize Dr. La Rosa. He's in the audience. Dr. La Rosa, he's right here. He is the reason why we have Brooklyn Health Disparity Center. We don't talk about it a lot, but he's the one who made sure that the institution uh, set up the, he is the reason why we have Brooklyn Health Disparity Center. We don't talk about it a lot, but he's the one who made sure that the institution uh, set up the Brooklyn Health Disparity Center in collaboration with the Arthur Ashe Institute for Urban Health and with the Brooklyn Borough President. So we are really very thankful to you for setting it up. Now it's our time to take it and run and make sure that the Brooklyn Health Disparity Center in collaboration with the Arthur Ashe Institute for Urban Health and with the Brooklyn Borough President. So we are really very thankful to you for setting it up. Now it's our time to take it and run and make sure it, it does what it's supposed to do. But I really agree with all the things you said and I would open up to the discussion further. Thank you, Dr. Salafu. Uh, Dr. David, in our- But I really agree with all the things you said and I would open up to the discussion further. Thank you, Dr. Salafu. Uh, Dr. David, in our 50 states with varying populations of blacks and whites, is there a difference in the quality of health care that 50 states with varying populations of blacks and whites, is there a difference in the quality of health care that can be discerned that relates to the proportion of minorities within the state? Well, I actually had a graph, uh, I actually had a concern that relates to the proportion of minorities within the state. Well, I actually had a graph, uh, I actually had a map that I pulled out of the, pro the, pro the presentation because there's quite a lot of stuff in there already. But if you look at the southern states that have higher, a higher proportion of African Americans, map that I pulled out of the, pro the, pro the presentation because there's quite a lot of stuff in there already. But if you look at the southern states that have higher, a higher proportion of African Americans, the disparity in life expectancy between African Americans and white are greater than, let's say, New York for some reason, because I think we have a lot of safety net institutions here. Thank you. In life expectancy between African Americans and white are greater than, let's say, New York for some reason, because I think we have a lot of safety net institutions here. Thank you. Can we have the lights on, please? I just want to piggyback on that last comment. Uh, there, was a, there was a stat that showed that the 10 most corrupt states. Can we have the lights on, please? I just want to piggyback on that last comment. Uh, there, was a, there was a stat that showed that the 10 most corrupt states spent the most on law enforcement, uh, construction, and prison, and prison in, law, in correction. And they spent the least in health care on law enforcement, uh, construction, and prison, and prison in law in correction, and they spent the least in health care and education, and most of those states are in the South, and so that's a big plays plays a big part in health care disparity because of the access to the care and, and education, and most of those states are in the South, and so that's a big plays plays a big part in health care disparity because of the access to the care in that, in, in our priorities in the society, you know, we're not focusing on the health care needs of that patient population. Well, one other question, Dr. David. Our priorities in the society, you know, we're not focusing on the health care needs of that patient population. Well, one other question, Dr. David. Within Downstate Medical Center, without pointing any fingers at a specific group or a specific location or a specific service. Is there dis within Downstate Medical Center, without pointing any fingers at a specific group or a specific location or a specific service, is there a discernible and detectable racial discrimination practice that you have seen? I cannot say that I have seen racial discrimination practice here. And in fact, I mean, look at racial discrimination practiced that you have seen? I cannot say that I have seen racial discrimination practiced here. 
And in fact, I mean, looking at in terms of the life expectancy of our population around here, I would have to say that we are probably doing a better job and a great service to our patients that we serve here. Is in, in terms of the life expectancy of our population around here, I would have to say that we are probably doing a better job and a great service to our patients that we serve here. Is it that you haven't looked here or that you don't want to talk about it? I haven't seen it. I haven't gone looking for it specifically, but from my day-to-day -day interactions and observations, I have not Are seen it. Are looked here or that you don't want to talk about it? I haven't seen it. I haven't gone looking for it specifically, but from my day-to-day -day interactions and observations, I have not Are seen it. Are there any sub-areas within New York where you have, you're aware of racial disparity in the quality of health care? I would definitely say Brownsville and Are there any sub-areas within New York where you have, you're aware of racial disparity in the quality of health care? I would definitely say Brownsville and East New York. It's staggering, the decrease in, in life expectancy that they have over there. Thank you. Please. Excellent presentation, Dr. David. Um, I really learned a lot from the decrease in, in life expectancy that they have over there. Thank you. Please. Excellent presentation, Dr. David. Um, I really learned a lot from you. You put it together very well. It was Could very, you speak slower and louder? It was very co cogent and very well done. Congratulations, and I need a set of your slides. My question that I have for you, you, you put it together very well. It was Could very, you speak slower and louder? It was very co cogent and very well done. Congratulations, and I need a set of your slides. My question that I have for you, since you've been here for many years training, how do we improve access to our patients to care and how do we reduce the power differential for many years training how do we improve access to our patients to care and how do we reduce the power differential that is between the doctor and the patient in this community. And I'm gonna put this in the context. I mean, I, we here in the room are honored to serve one of the best that is between the doctor and the patient in this community. And I'm gonna put this in the context. I mean, I, we here in the room are honored to serve one of the best patient population in the United States and in the world. The Afro-Caribbean patients have two jobs. There is no abused child in the emergency room. There is no spousal abuse in the emergency in the United States and in the world. The Afro-Caribbean patients have two jobs. There is no abused child in the emergency room. There is no spousal abuse in the emergency room. We have the best patient and I'm every day honored to serve them. What I wanna know is how to decrease the power differential as such, when I give a patient myself to room, we have the best patient and I'm every day honored to serve them. What I wanna know is how to decrease the power differential. As such, when I give a patient my cell phone number, they call and they don't wait five days with febrile neutropenia because they don't wanna bother the doctor. Do you have any ideas on that? Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shapiro. No, they don't wait five days with febrile neutropenia because they don't wanna bother the doctor. Do you have any ideas on that? Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shapiro. Now that's a really difficult bridge to, to cross, but I think first it starts with us being aware of what other unconscious biases that we may have. Really, try That's a really difficult bridge to, to cross, but I think first it starts with us being aware of what other unconscious biases that we may have, really trying to get to know the community without developing stereotypes, and really with our day-to-day -day engagement with patients, build trust over time so that they feel comfortable engaging us. And with regard to without developing stereotypes, and really with our day-to-day -day engagement with patients, build trust over time so that they feel comfortable engaging us. And with regard to your first question about access, I think it really has to start with primary care. I think we really need to expand our capabilities of providing primary care because that's often the first entry point. For so your first question about access, I think it really has to start with primary care. I think we really need to expand our capabilities of providing primary care because that's often the first entry point for patients into our health system. Are there any changes within our Department of Medicine and our practice of medicine that you advocate based on the need to improve the system. Are there any changes within our Department of Medicine and our practice of medicine that you advocate based 
on the need to improve health care for minority groups? So within the medicine department, the areas that I would focus on are really developing new models for improving our cultural competence. Health care for minority groups. So within the medicine department, the areas that I would focus on are really developing new models for improving our cultural competency, improving primary care, as I mentioned a little while ago, as well as building community engagement into our curriculum. Because oftentimes people think that including prim primary care, as I mentioned a little while ago, as well as building community engagement into our curriculum. Because oftentimes people think that prim community engagement is just at the level of primary care. But as you can see, all of these subspecialties get affected by racial health care disparities and can make a difference in community engagement. Thank you. Community engagement is just at the level of primary care, but as you can see, all of these subspecialties get affected by racial health care disparities and can make a difference in community engagement. Thank you. We'll take a couple of more questions, and then we're going on to the Department of Medicine faculty meeting. Thank you for a really wonderful talk. Uh, as a resident, I think many of us struggle every day with working... ...and then we're going on to the Department of Medicine faculty meeting. Thank you for a really wonderful talk. Uh, as a resident, I think many of us struggle every day with com working, managing, and communicating with patients with low healthcare literacy. Um, as you, in your research and over your experience, do you have any strategies or advice you can provide us? How can we work with patients who are managing and communicating with patients with low healthcare literacy? Um, as you, in your research and over your experience, do you have any strategies or advice you can provide us? How can we work with patients who sometimes don't understand the very basic terms that we're talking to them about? Well, I would say in the first instance, always assess where the patient is, and then always use analogies. Understand the very basic terms that we're talking to them about. Well, I would say in the first instance, always assess where the patient is, and then always use analogies, day-to-day -day analogies that can help them concept conceptualize what exactly is going on with their disease. And I think so once you start from there, you can build them up slowly, and each time they learn a little bit more. Day-to-day -day analogies that can help them concept conceptualize what exactly is going on with their disease. And I think so once you start from there, you can build them up slowly, and each time they learn a little bit more. And the possibility is that this question might be answered next week as well, during Grand Rounds. Yes. And would you uh, conclude with the top two take-home points? The possibility is that this question might be answered next week as well, during Grand Rounds. Yes. And would you uh, conclude with the top two take-home points that you'd like to give to our house staff? What are the two most important things that you mean to convey to us? So my two most important things are one, be aware of your own that you'd like to give to our house staff. What are the two most important things that you mean to convey to us? So my two most important things are one, be aware of your, un un your unconscious biases and really seek to engage and build trust with your patients. And then two, document, record, research everything's biases and really seek to engage and build trust with your patients. And then two, document, record, research everything that you know, because it all adds vital information to help really shape guidelines to target this population. All of us, Dr. David, who are impressed with your... ...that you know, because it all adds vital information to help really shape guidelines to target this population. All of us, Dr. David, who are impressed with your presentation, including me, have a desire now to follow your growth in academic medicine. You're going to a number one institution for further, including me, have a desire now to follow your growth in academic medicine. You're going to a number one institution for further training, and then I think you're going to impact what we do, and we're fortunate to have you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Friedman. Thank you. <laughs> Training, and then I think you're going to impact what we do, and we're fortunate to have you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Friedman. Thank you. <laughs>